welcome back to Capital Culture. Now, we've done carnival, we've done commuting, we've done food. This time, we're talking about fashion. And London, I think it's fair to say, is one of the fashion capitals of the world. Some would argue maybe the fashion capital of the world. But I'm going to be asking how sustainable our fashion industry really is. And I've got three people joining me who know a lot about this subject. I've got Brixton-based uh, fashion designer Alice Early. I've got fashion commentator Karen Franklin, uh, who you may also uh, very well remember as the presenter of The Clothes Show. And I've got Carmel McQuaid, who is Head of Sustainability at Marks and Spencers. So, guys, thank you very much indeed for joining oh, no. me. <laughs> Karen, I'm going to start with you, actually, because I just said there, people may very well remember you from the clothes show, which started out in the, in the, the 80s. 80s. Right. Yeah. So how much have you seen the industry change since then, for better or, or for worse? And you want that really short, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you but, talk But, you know, away. clearly, nearly um, uh, sort of, I've been in the industry nearly four decades now, mm. so I, I have seen it change completely from UK production, and zero technology, um, no kind of digital marketing, um, right through to a, a space that people simply couldn't have envisioned, mm. which the speed in which clothes are turned over, the price drop that we've seen, whereas it goes, it's sort of counterintuitive to everything else that we understand that, that you know, the cost of living rises, but the, the price of a garment now is so cheap compared to when I began. Um, and of course, all of our production is done way over the other side of the world mm. by people who are, to a certain ex extent, um, you know, kind of existing in a kind of space of modern day slavery. Now, Alice, you say you design sustainable clothes mm, for yes. women, but tell us what that what that means and why it was so important to you to make that your priority. Yeah, so I take a few different approaches to the way I design. Um, the, one of the biggest parts of it is um, sourcing. So I source uh, GOT certified cotton. GOT certified, yep. what's that? Global Organic Textile Standard. Okay. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it makes for quite a hard, uh, it's hard work. A lot of suppliers okay. don't want to provide small volumes. And mm. as a small brand, my other focus is designing small batches. So I actually design and pattern cut my collections and I produce small um, batches here in London. Mm. So I'm able to visit my factories, uh, meet the people who are making my clothes um, and I source things like the buttons which are made from Carozo, uh -huh. um, which come from uh, the Tagua Palm in the Ecuador rainforest. But I actually get mine uh, from a supplier mm. in the UK. Okay. So, um, but they're a beautiful button, they're an alternative to polyester. Yeah. They have a natural grain, uh, but they also provide um, a good living for people working because the nut falls naturally to the earth when it's ripe. Wow. So, and so everything, uh, the way I approach my work is if I can find a better option, then I will take that. Oh, well, and okay. yeah. That's amazing. So I want to talk a bit more about your uh, the materials you use mm. in a minute because that's amazing, everything down to yeah. the button. I would never have yeah. thought about yeah. buttons. Um, yeah. But uh, I guess you've got designers like you on the one hand who are sort of really making sustainability their priority and then on the other hand, the sort of big high street brands you talked about there, Karen, who are selling things kind of fast and, and cheap. Carmel, where does Marks & Spencer sit in all of that? Well, we've always had quality. It's the it's the it's always been the essence of our brand. So in some ways that overlaps really nicely with sustainability because we've always cared about how our products are made, where they're made, what materials go into them. And over time, as we started to realise some of these issues, we were one of the first or the leading large retailer to say, right, let's we need a clear chemical policy. We did that 20 years ago. We need responsible sourcing standards, global sourcing standards for factories overseas. And we did that and published it. We we're the first people to say, we, you know, our factories are around the world, but we know where every single one of them is. And we visit them each and every year. We publish it on our map. So it's, I think there's there's a space for large and small. And you can, our, our ambition is to source ethically and sustainably. And um, we do it in slightly different ways because of the scale in which we do it. But we're very... We're aligned yeah. on the way in which we want to sell fashion. Yeah, yeah, because I suppose it is something that absolutely everybody needs to be thinking about now. I was shocked to read that the fashion industry was responsible for the felling of 150 million trees last mm. year. I mean, that's incredible. I, for people that don't know, why is that? Trees aren't made of, of wood. 
What, what is it? It's for fabric, isn't it? You, that... you mean clothes on made of wood? Yeah. yeah. What did I say? Trees on made of wood? Yes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So for people that don't know, why is that? Because I don't think people necessarily think about fabric coming from... Well, uh, you know, I think uh, trees are one example. There is a, you know, a huge amount of pollutant dyes and chemicals running off into rivers. There's a vast amount of clean water required for producing either just the cotton crop, uh, cotton crop, <laughs> or <laughs> or actually washing the end product um, and putting it out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, across the board, there is a, a huge toll taken on the environment in order to put product out there. And then, of course, the life after it has been discarded, again, impacts on the environment as landfill because we simply aren't uh, circulating, keeping this product in circulation. We're encouraging, we're, to a certain extent, the whole system of buy new, buy new encourages mm. people to discard and, um, you know, kind of engage with new product that's being generated. And is that what consumers want, do you think? Fast, cheap fashion? Or do they want, I, I sort of hear really mixed things, or do they want ethically made, sustainable clothes? You can't group them in, Mi you know, one no. sort of yeah. homogenous homogenous group. I'd certainly think but there are winning? there are prompts all the time um, mm. for consumers to be buying, to be getting rid of some, uh, you know, getting rid of existing clothes and to mm. buy new. And certainly fast fashion operates on a price mm. bribe. Mm. How could you not buy this? It's so cheap. Mm. But then there's, you know, there are other consumers who would say that, you know, they're not mindless consumers, they're citizen participants. They're voting with their money and every purchase they make is, is in support of mm. ethical or pro-social process. I think there's, yeah. that's a growing Band. Yeah. We've we've done lots of research on on this topic of why people want to buy new clothes. So, firstly, our clothes are made to last and 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 durable. And um, and we've spent a lot of time. And I'm a, I'm an engineer, so I tend to focus on technical and science. And and um, so we spent a lot of time like how can we make them last longer? And then we did some really great psychological research with customers to realise that there's a whole thing about novelty and newness. And rather mm -hmm. than try and tell people it's wrong to want new, just to understand that and embrace it. So what we've started to do is more of this what we call emotional durability mm. Mm. Um, and helping our stylists show people how you can rewear your clothes and enjoy rewearing them and get that sense of excitement mm. about this is a new outfit to me mm. so I've worn it with a different necklace and I've worn it with different tights and boots it's a completely new look so you get that sense of um, this is new and fashion but actually the physical materials are essentially the same dress. So our Try Tuesday service, which you can see on Instagram, and you know, goes increasingly you'll see more of the MS marketing being about, you know, rewear your boots with this dress or buy once, wear it five times. Yeah. And I think that was a trick that maybe some of the technical people like me had missed for a number of years. Mm. Yeah. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because as a, um, a retailer, you do want people to be coming in and buying new clothes. Well, that's the thing I wanted to say. But surely you're under pressure to sell, 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 because yeah. that is the, that's the capitalist model. Well, we see our space. Uh, it's great because yeah. there's space for lots of people. And I think um, there is a space where we can all agree that maybe there's some fashion that isn't value adding. And um, so if we're taking market share from that market, I think that's useful in the whole system. Um, okay. yeah. Yeah. I, think, uh, I think consumers are becoming much more conscious of how they're shopping. Yeah. Mm. So, for example, they are buying things yes, that last a long time, but maybe have, um, a, you know, people thinking more about their style. Mm. And again, they're thinking how they can introduce pieces into their wardrobe and it not being that, you know, in, mm. out, one week in, one week out sort of mm. thing. Um, and the other part is fashion rental, um, which I think people are starting to explore. Yeah. Um, okay. And I've actually partnered with a fashion rental company, My Wardrobe HQ. Okay. So these collections are available to rent. Okay. Um, so tell us a bit more about these. You've told us about the buttons, but what else yeah, can you say so about them? What makes them sustainable? So, for example, so we have this shirt, which is organic cotton, mm -hmm. got certified, um, the Corozo buttons, um, and and this is the same for this one, a different, different fabric, different weave, but again, got certified. Um, this one's, uh, this trouser is quite interesting. 
We have, <laughs> <laughs> we have, again, organic cotton got certified. We've got the Corozo buttons, yeah. which are the natural alternative to polyester. And we have um, the sustainable viscose, okay. which is, refers to your uh, reference about what's made from wood. Mm. It's a wood pulp. Viscose, yeah. 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 So uh, it's a sustainable source. So it's from f some managed forests okay. um, that are replanted. Okay. Yeah. So Fantastic. all the materials, including uh, the interfacings, um, I found recyclable options for. Okay. So uh, all the way along the, the process, I'm trying to think what other, what alternative materials can I use as, and that goes down to my packaging and everything. Yeah, else. so yeah. this sounds great, but what I'm wondering while you're telling me is how much more work it creates for you and how much more, well, how much of a, a dent it puts on your profits, I suppose. It is, it is expensive, yeah. uh, partly because I'm a small brand. I'm ordering small volumes mm. um, and I'm producing small volumes. So not only my fabric costs are higher than if I was buying in bulk, but my, my make costs are higher. Um, Corrosive buttons are more expensive mm. than plastic buttons. Um, but all these things I think are important. Yeah. And I want to tell people why they're important. Does it frustrate and you that not everyone is, is well, doing the same? It's, it, it, I mean, it's great. I stand out from the crowd. But yeah. um, I think more or more people actually are turning that way and thinking mm -hmm. about how they can shift parts of the business. Um, I've taken a sort of holistic approach to my design process. Um, uh, you know, the clothes are more expensive. Yeah. Than, yeah. than what you can yeah. get on the high street. But I think if people buy, you know, one special piece that they can wear all the time, these yeah. pieces are all able to be washed. Um, so, you know, they don't have to dry clean, which is also not a particularly uh, sustainable way of, of garment care. And uh, Carmel, you guys use sustainable cotton, don't you? But am I right in thinking it, it wouldn't be in all of your garments? Or is it 47%? Did no, I get that it's, right? no, it's way higher, which is, is higher? great. Yeah. Okay, great. And so we started over 12 years ago where we yeah. said we want 100% of the cotton that we source to be from sustainable sources. Yeah. It was really tough in the first few years because we were almost like a small brand because, again, the market was like, yeah. eh, who do you think you are? Yeah. Um, and we really had to struggle in terms of sourcing of supply and, and cost. Um, but we kept at it, kept persistent persevering, realised we had to work in collaboration. We partnered with WWF and with the Better mm. Cotton Initiative. Mm. Um, and then the next barrier was really trying to persuade smallholder farmers whose livelihoods depend on changing. Mm. You know, they need this cotton and we're asking them to farm in a slightly mm. different way. That's mm. a massive risk for them. So we realised it was really important that they needed support during this transition to believe that if you use less fertiliser, you'll still get the same yield and you can use less water in a more precise way. So over a year, number of years partnership, this year for the first time we've reached 100% of the cotton that we source from our clothing comes from um, sustain, more sustainable cotton. Okay. It's, it's better cotton initiative cotton. It's not yeah. perfect, of course not, but it's significantly mm. better. And importantly, I think we've worked with other brands to kind of get them to drive yeah. the demand for that as mm. well too, which means more farmers yeah. will transition to it, improve environmental impact. m and profits, as we know, it was in the headlines, are down this year. Is that something you have to, to think about? You know, does, does prioritising sustainability also potentially affect M&S profits? A big company like M&S, and is that something you have to consider when you're deciding how to play it, what to do, where to get your supply from? Yeah, I think we've, we've always thought about, let's think about what our customer wants and what they need. Mm. And actually, our customer, the M&S customer, and the sort of business and brand that we are, it, it wasn't going to be we could add a premium for sustainability. It was very much about when we set out a load of ambitious goals under Plan A, mm. it was sort of like on the basis of we need to figure out how to do it in such a way that we're not just asking our customer to pay more. And we should be able to do that given the scale that we have, given the technical know-hows that we have, given the collaborations that we can have. So it's been a case of us kind of maybe figuring out how can we use the assets, the unique assets that MS has. And I'd say one of the things is we have some excellent technical and sourcing people built up over the 137 years of heritage and know-how about clothing. And if you can put their brains and creativity to this challenge, I, they have found ways to um, send signals to the market to say, you know what, don't just add, there's a lot of lazy practices that happen in, man, in big production where they hear that you want green and they just whack 20% premium on. They haven't actually changed anything and that's not okay. Mm. So we were determined that that would not be the, you know, just passing on mm. a fake premium to customers because we've called it green. What happens to the stuff that doesn't sell? Yeah, because you know. <laughs> yeah. well, we, we, we buy as best as we can, so make, yeah. let's make sure we sell it. Let's make sure we order, you know, pick the best designs, order the right stock. It 
doesn't always work. The weather goes against us sometimes. And then we'll, we'll obviously do what you call an old fashioned retailing sell. So lower your price, see if people want to buy it then. Anything that doesn't sell, we have an outlet network. So a number of our outlets. So we'll try and so we'll always. So the aspiration is clothes should be used as clothes. Mm. So even if it means we've made less money from it, but let's make sure that the purpose they were designed for and built for happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so and then we have a partnership with Oxfam and um, so we have a partnership for our customers to take back clothes we call it swapping so unwanted clothes um, and that's hugely successful but we've then used that same infrastructure if we have surplus stock we will give it into the Oxfam Waste Saver Programme in the UK and we know we've because we've audited that whole thing and we know it's ethical and we know where mm. it will go mm. and as much as possible ends up being worn by people either through the Oxfam shops or it gets sent overseas or it gets sent to their social enterprise for boutique in Senegal and if if there's anything left then that just really is not selling um, it can get recycled as insulation or wiper material but there's it's the best way we can find of dealing with surplus clothes mm. um, if Oxfam don't have capacity we have two other partnerships with New Life and shelter and um, charity shops that can take surplus right. stock as well. Uh, and you know, clearly that you've thought about the the whole cycle, but we still have a huge amount of um, a big business where clothing is. Um, if it doesn't sell, you know, we still have stories of it being burned mm -hmm. or um, cut up into to rags. Mm -hmm. Ultimately. Um, you know, there are, we t I talked about price bribes from fast fashion. You know, there are online stores that are, you know, kind of sending their clothing out, but it's being sent back, having been worn mm -hmm. for one night only. Um, and there, there's one brand that you can wear it for a whole month and then send it back and get fully refunded. I've, I've taken a slightly different approach. Um, I've made small collections but the, the things that are left over I will be giving to my wardrobe HQ for rental mm. um, and then the mm. other process the other thing I'm trying this this season well the other thing is my my clothes aren't really designed for one in one out they no. should be sort of all to buy this year they'll also be in Not fashion next Christmas year. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and then I'm going to try a pre-order system Okay. So for my winter yeah. pieces that I'm introducing, um, it will be on a pre-order basis. Okay. Um, so I will only produce what actually is ordered. Right. Okay. Yeah, um, and that actually is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of, like Vin and Omi, who um, big London Fashion Week brand, who say that they don't want stores to over-order. Mm. They only want small orders mm. to go out to independent buyers, so that nothing is is reduced in the sale. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. you know, it has a it has a premium. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, Karen, when I was talking to you earlier, we were talking about um, how much m how much more stuff is produced overseas these days than it used to be. Mm. Um, how important is it to produce locally in order to be sustainable? Do you think? I have actually, your... well, personally, yeah. really yeah. struggled with fi with finding factories. Right. Um, the costs are incredibly high. They're they're more expensive than a lot of people would consider starting to buy something at so of course you're talking about factories here yeah yeah, in, yeah. well and i've been working with ones in london yeah um the quality is fantastic and i'm really happy but the costs are very very high mm. so um i think it is a struggle for small brands and so what do you do you make your clothes here but your materials come from overseas uh, europe yeah so europe yeah. yeah my materials come from england and europe mm -hmm. um obviously things are grown in india the cotton um, but yeah, I produce everything locally. Yeah. Um. We have people in sourcing offices in country who yeah. will visit the factories and, and will know them really well. And um, there's a lot you can do in how how you spec both, as, as you'll all know, how you spec the production method, the fibre, the fabric, um, and even the processing techniques. So we will say that we want a certain dyeing technology to be used because we know it's lower water, lower chemicals. Mm -hmm. So it. There is a fallacy sometimes on sustainability, and I see it a lot in our food business, that local is good and in mm. British is best. I think it's an emotional, you know, the feeling that it's it's here, so it must be good. It's yeah. not always. There's some absolute, yeah. and I'll be honest with you, when we brought together our textile factories and our food factories to share learning, some of our textile factories in Sri Lanka had the best understanding of how to minimise energy and water and um, because in their country resources were so precious and they actually taught a lot of our English food factories how to do it, actually our sandwich maker. That was really great for me to see that there's no mm. geographical limit on good ideas, especially as technology is coming through a lot more. What really does matter though is the, the rule of the land is important so we rely the the pollution controls and the, the rules that government have to impose 
the rule of, you know, basic legality does vary by country. And that's where we will say, well, this is the MS standard. Yeah. We expect you to comply with that. And we'll, ne we'll have to work harder because we'll maybe know that local enforcement isn't as strong as we'd yeah. like it to be on a wide range of issues. Do you think people expect to own more clothes these days than perhaps they used to? Uh, I certainly know from speaking to someone who's in removals, who's my age, who said that, um, <laughs> you know, the furniture hasn't changed, but the amount of clothes that they now take out of a house, mm. you know, has quadrupled. Quadrupled? Was because we, wow. you know, have, we have an expectation, I think, of, of clothes for all different um, parts of our lives. When, you know, I look at my you know, my sort of parents' model was that there was a best outfit and then there was a work outfit and then there was um, a sort of uh, an old outfit that had come through both those two kind of things. You, you didn't then buy recreational clothing. You wore what was on its way, wear, you know, wearing yeah. out. I mean, it, it is very different. And I grew up where clothes, you know, we had the sewing machine out all the time and my mum was always making... Um, clothes for us. Yeah, so that's another a point, isn't it? Do people these days, I mean, I've got to admit, if I had a hole in my socks, I wouldn't be, you wouldn't catch me darning it, I'd be throwing <laughs> yeah. them out and buying a new pair. Yeah. Uh, um, that's not to say I'd do that with every item of clothing if it had a hole in it, yeah. but do people really know how to sew and darn these days? Or I do they just think, well, I can get a new one? I'm well, I know from, oh, yeah. from feedback from textile designers, at, uh, textile teachers at school, mm. that they have been completely marginalised and told that they have to um, be teaching other subjects and that, you know, because of the, the curriculum narrowing, that now un the un many students who could have come out with an understanding of what it takes to make a garment and the time it takes and the skill that it yeah. takes have now got no idea yeah. and think that, that Primark just presses a button and boof, yeah. you know, yeah. there's a garment. We did <laughs> a really interesting experiment as part of Bristol Green Week and we repeated it in different cities then. We put sewing machines into our shop and we did it um, as a charity thing, so using our old decor, make a bag, and the bag was a design for people in hospital with syringe drivers who are going through cancer treatment. So it was a one-hour masterclass, really simple thing to make, mm. a simple design. And and then people loved it so much. We ran some sewing lessons and it was phenomenal because we over we were listening to what customers were saying and it was often maybe grannies teaching their teenage grandchildren. Mm. They're like, oh, I used to do this. But people were like, look how hard it is to make a seam go straight. Mm. And then you were mm. like, oh, this is really interesting because actually people are now appreciating quality and looking oh, yeah. and appraising products slightly differently. Um, so I think that is a really interesting area. And I think Mary Cray brought it up as well too about sewing mm. lessons yeah. in schools. Yeah. And mm. if you think about the parallels in food where we've had almost a similar thing where people maybe haven't valued food as much as they should because yeah. maybe they didn't appreciate what it takes to grow it and what it takes to make mm -hmm. a meal and um, the importance of connecting young people with how clothes are made and and mm -hmm. that feeling of yeah. effort that's gone yeah. into it I yeah. think there's huge potential there and it fits with the vibe of especially in London people are interested in how are things made and this this kind of yeah. in a digital world people mm -hmm. are looking for a connection back with physical things I was so going to say the digital world has really I think mm -hmm. pushed people away from make from physically doing things yes right? um, yeah. Learning to sew on a button. Although, <laughs> that brings me nicely onto something I was going to ask you about. Depop, uh, this sort of part eBay, part Instagram app for buying and selling clothes. It's huge. And so whilst in some ways we're saying, you know, everyone's into fast fashion and they're buying things and throwing them away. Depop, I think they, they put some figures out this week. Their sales were up by 85 percent this year um, and a third of 15 to 24 year olds are using it. So second hand is having a bit of a moment. Maybe people aren't darning their own socks, but they are getting into recycling and and buying older clothes and reusing them, is that and fair to say? It is. I mean, both my daughters do it, so they're constantly saying to me, Mum, Mum, have you got anything? Because <laughs> you know, your stuff is good quality. Um, but that's the key thing, is that that generation, they don't want to buy a cheap no. kind of T-shirt, mm. or they want something that's got a story, they want something that has a bit of brand heritage, that, that they can see has been made and is durable mm. and lasts. Yeah. And those are the things that are, have have got real currency. So I, it's really great to see that, you know, it's not just secondhand shops, bricks and mortar, mm. that it's taking place 
um, digitally as well. And I think it's really important to remind people that stores like Oxfam have a spectacular online resource. So just because one isn't near you. And also, you may have size requirements that you don't always find mm. just by walking into mm. a, a second-hand store that you want to research online. And they photograph everything and it's up there. They have amazing, um, you know, heritage designer things up there. So it's really worth second-hand online as well. Well, I was going to say, speaking of, of things with a story and, and brand heritage, I've got to ask you all what you're wearing today. I <laughs> can't let you go without doing that. So, Alice, we'll start with you. Well, I actually am wearing all Alice early. You practice what you preach. Yeah, nice. yeah very comfortable, yes. breathable. Yeah. You yeah. always you can wear all Alice early. I don't always wear. I have, yeah. I have, another, I have a wardrobe where I can... But I often do wear pieces with what I already have. Yeah. So everything is, you know, and I yeah. do tend to have a simple style, so I like to, you know, accessorise or, you yeah. know, just okay. be comfortable. Good, <laughs> Practical. Yeah. I've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so all organic cotton, um, uh, this is a classic, one of my on. classic shirts yeah. and the classic trouser from, okay. from the winter. Okay, yeah. Karen, what about you? So, of course, I had to think about it because <laughs> this morning when I was getting dressed. So, I, these are Pozu boots, which are, you know, they work with natural materials. So, this is cork, natural rubber, non-solvent glue. And this is... Um, this is vintage skirt, which is like a more expensive second-hand it's shop, amazing. isn't it? So I, I saw that and I, I calculated pence per wear in yeah. my head as I was thinking. This was this was three pounds from wow. a second-hand oh, store, um, and then this is a, a high street blouse that I bought, but I've had it for three years. And on that note, I want to say. I have got two silk blouses that I bought from M&S, which are well over 20 years old. Oh, there you Still go. Going. Durable. You know, durable. I just yeah, want to come back to your everything. boots for a second. So they're vegan leather or, or some leather alternative? So, so this is a leather alternative yeah. and there are um, leaps and bounds being made um, in this field because obviously leather alternatives don't biodegrade yeah. with it, the effectiveness that natural yes. materials do. Um, However, we know that the you know the, the the pull on the climate in order to sustain leather um, it, itself yeah. um, there are negatives there. So I, I I was reading that this company have just bought out a vegan leather leather that um, has apple pectin at uh -huh. it as its formulation, which which clearly allows it to. Um, decompose. Yeah, the online more. searches for vegan yeah. leather were up by I think 40% last year. So people are changing their habits. I mean, maybe that mm. ties in with there's been a big sort of rise of veganism as well. Mm. Um, but you know, maybe people are thinking about not just what they're eating, what mm. they're wearing as well. In that sense. But that is where the power is. You know, we yeah. we may think that as an in individual, what can I do? And that's the wonder of social networking is that everyone can mobilise behind yeah. Yeah. the call for change and you know pass knowledge on to each other, mm. pass on positive news about brands and the way they're behaving and recommendations, and um, actually withdraw their custom from mm. brands that are not behaving in the way that they want them to with mm. the transparency that they need. But this is one of my favourite dresses. It's from a few years ago. It is M&S, um, but it's one of the kind of, you know, you can wear it really often and, you know, it never gets dated. What I really like about our clothes, because I'm really obsessed with climate change, is um, our care labels we put in years ago, Think Climate Wash of 30, and that's still there. And every now and then I check and see it. But for me, one of the, one of the fun things I had to do early on was calculate the carbon footprint of a brand knickers because we wanted to understand how many carbon emissions are associated and actually at that time a lot of consumer behavior we were washing clothes far too high at too high temperatures mm. too often and actually that mm. accounts for a big part of carbon emissions and a whole clothing supply chain as well and that's why we put messages in our care label to reinforce what the detergent companies and the laundry companies were saying of guys wash your clothes at low temperatures because mm. the the detergents are good enough now and by the way not for bras and knickers but for other products you don't need to wash them every time Absolutely. you wear them and that's a really simple and important thing that everyone can do and you don't need to iron so much that's another great one isn't mm, it it's absolutely. like yeah thinking about london are we better at this sustainability stuff than other big fashion capitals of the world or not i definitely think we are leading um, when I was recently at a fabric show, um, it was made clear to me that the suppliers were saying that the people from the UK are asking for more sustainable mm. materials than some of the other countries. Um, okay. So I think we are doing our bit. 
I, 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 I certainly think that you know we had um, Aesthetica at London Fashion Week a good while ago. Some of the key people like Orsella de Castro, Olivia Firth, mm -hmm. Safia Mini, um, sort of UK advocates for change are globally yeah. known. Yeah. We have some amazing um, London Fashion Week designers specifically working in a sustainable way, very high profile, Christopher Rayburn being one who has consistently kind of stood um, up for, you know, uh, minimal waste, um, you know, mm. sustainable uh, materials. And I also think, you know, our education system is leading the way. We have the Centre of Sustainability in the London College of yeah. Yeah. Ashen. Thought up by you. I was going to ask you about that. How well, many years ago? I, I was an external assessor there and I saw the amazing work that Dillis Williams and mm -hmm. her yeah. students were doing yeah. um, and felt that, you know, where was the recognition of, of this group of students who were graduating? But the playing field was the same and yet mm -hmm. we know how much harder it is, how yeah. much longer it yeah. takes, how much more complex it is to deliver the, the quality and that's on top of the aesthetic. So my recommendation was that you know, London College of Fashion should own that space and create this centre of excellence. So mm. it was merely a recommendation and, and Dillis then took it up um, and, and ran with it. And obviously, again, it ha has created an international platform for exchange around practice and um, sort of protocol going mm. forward. So I think, you know, we can say that uh, here in London, you know, and, and the UK sensibility generally is that, you know, we are always very quick off the mark and we are flagging up a, a, a way of doing things that, that needs to be adapted and adopted by everyone. Carmel, do you think Londoners, um, you must see all of our shopping habits, do you think Londoners have sustainability in mind when they're shopping more than elsewhere in the country or actually do you think we're all rushing around so much, so busy, that this fast fashion is is more what we kind of indulge in, if you like. Mm. <laughs> well, I, I can, I'm sort of an honorary Londoner, given the number of hours I spend <laughs> in London. Um, I I think the culture, the awareness is higher, mm. and that, and that's a great start. I mm -hmm. think it maybe mm -hmm. the barriers to translate it into practice. You know, so the desire is there, and our job is if we can make it easier for people to make the right choices and do the right things. I think London will tip into huge behaviour change. Um, but definitely, especially in the last twelve to eighteen months, I've seen a huge level of interest in what our customers are writing into us about, what they're commenting on social media, mm -hmm. um, and what our colleagues are talking about. So I think mm -hmm. the the ability to share knowledge around London and inspire and motivate and and, and make something socially acceptable um, is great. And if it can be socially acceptable to boast about the sustainability credentials of your clothes, then we'll have we'll mm -hmm. made a massive step forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So final question to you all: If you could tell people watching to bear one thing in mind when they are going out and buying clothes, what would it be, Alice? For me, I think you've got to really love what you're buying yeah. and want to wear it a lot. Um, hopefully it's made from sustainable fabrics, mm -hmm. hopefully it's something that can be recycled at end of life or passed on, but I think ultimately if you don't love something, you're not going to look after it well, you're not going to look after it after it's been bought um, and continue mm -hmm. to, to wear it. So. Okay, yeah. Aaron? I'd um, just hijack that question a little bit and yeah. say I would recommend that everybody watches a film by Michael Winterbottom which will be released on the 22nd of November called Greed. Okay. It is highly entertaining, um, starring Steve Coogan as a well-known high street uh, figure who is literally siphoning money out of the system and putting it into his own pocket. But you see the extremes. You see the way in which people who prioritise profit only selling fashion can behave and you see um, the way in which workers at the other end of the um, scale, you know, the lives that they live, but it's, it's done very cleverly and I, I challenge anybody to come out of that film and carry on as normal as okay. if nothing has so changed. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll all have to reconvene and yeah. talk again. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Carmel, final thought from you. I, 
I spend all my time in this space and what I would say to people is don't be afraid and don't be intimidated. You don't have to have a PhD in sustainability and environmental mm. impact. I think people are intimidated by the terminology and the there's no, oh, there's not always a right or wrong answer mm. and they can be like, oh, should I get lead or should I get vegan? I don't know, but uh, just make, just take time and learn a little bit about what you're buying. And if you won't go wrong, if you buy something made to last, if you love it and when you're finished wearing it, pass it on, yeah. swap it with us, give it to a charity shop, hand it to your friend. There's simple principles about just cherish mm. clothes and treat them as precious mm. and then you won't go too far wrong. Sounds like good advice. Right, so much to think about there, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, that's Thank you. it till next time. <laughs>